You're listening to Standing Before the Mass podcast with Chris Eaton, sponsored by Newport Nautical Supply. Hey folks, how's it going? Welcome to the latest episode of the podcast. My guest for this episode is nautical author and historian Eric Weberg. Eric has an infectious enthusiasm coupled with a relentless curiosity for all things maritime. Eric is focused on the human element. Whether it be tragedy or triumph, Eric's work connects us with the people involved. Here are some Eric facts I've called from his website. Born in New York in 1970, Eric Weberg is a citizen of Sweden and the U.S. He is the author of over 20 books on maritime history, particularly in the Bahamas where he grew up. He left the Bahamas at 13 for boarding schools in New England and enrolled at Boston College in 1989. He was hired to race to Bermuda in 1989 and in 1991 sailed as mate from Antigua to Belgium to attend Harris Manchester College, Oxford. In 1993, he self-published five collections of writings and set out on a voyage from Panama to New Zealand on a 68-foot wooden boat, becoming captain in the Galapagos. A year of travel was the basis for a coming-of-age memoir. Eric earned his U.S. Coast Guard 100-ton captain's license in 1995. He moved to Singapore to operate a commercial fleet of tanker ships. After three years, he returned to Newport, where he would write off-season and deliver yachts to and from the Caribbean from spring to fall. After his fourth round-the-world trip, he enrolled at Roger Williams School of Law on a half-scholarship and passed the bar in 2005. Eric also earned a master's degree in marine affairs from University of Rhode Island. He has operated 120 vessels over 75,000 miles. He sailed to or from Bermuda over 30 times and sailed across two oceans. Eric has had stints with Titan Salvage and Overseas Salvage in Freeport, Bahamas, and in 2010, he joined Tradewinds, the Norwegian shipping publication. From 2013 to 2019, Eric was in marketing for McAllister Towing in Manhattan, where he lived until 2019. He is on the New York Yacht Club Library Committee and the Steamship Historical Society Board. Eric has published over 100 articles addressed 50 international audiences, and appeared on TV or film seven times for audiences in Spain, France, Norway, and for the BBC. He has also been featured in Vanity Fair. U.S. Congress leveraged his research in November 2019 to issue medals to 10 U.S. Navy aviators for the sinking of U-84. Eric is active on Instagram, where you can find him at Eric Weberg, that's E-R-I-C-W-I-B-E-R-G, And be sure to check out his website. You'll find links there for all of his books and stories. There's some, I think there's some video clips. That is E-R-I-C-W-I-B-E-R-G.com. I hope you enjoy. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for joining me. Um, You are an author and historian, but you have also traveled extensively. And you have an extensive sailing resume, I understand. So get us started. How did you, how did you get into sailing? Sure. Good question. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm proud to say that I, I've never won a race. So I'm not one of those kind of racing chest beating folks, um, although I admire their skill. Um, uh, for me, sailing was always an escape. Um, I grew up in a small, uh, what was a colony when I was a child and then became a country. Uh, the Bahamas came to the uh, St. George's because I heard it was on an island and it is, and they had a sailboat that came to the Bahamas. Um, and so, um, I, I saw Newport and St. George's as a way to, um, you know, connect me with the world at sea. Uh, I wanted to walk around the world, but I, I, there's too much wet stuff. And, um, Geronimo is a boat that I would work on as soon as I graduated uh, in the summers and so forth. So, um, I ran away to say, see, you really, you know, Count von, uh, Felix von Luckner right. and others were you know, Peter the Great, you know, were my models. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Newport enabled me to do that. The defining moment, Chris, was when I was 17. I was at Bannister's Wharf. There was a Swedish vessel, a tall, a, 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 a working trawler with sails called the Svanen, and they had a totally um, a hodgepodge crew, and they were sailing to Sweden in the in the in the in the snow. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that one day. In the snow, 
Yeah, in yeah. like March, and and I, I I sat at the wharf like a child in the eighteen hundreds, right? And asked the captain, you know, Lars and 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 his wife, and there was a fellow there, you know, and and it was an amazing crew. And I thought it was their polyglot, you'd say, mm. you know, all different backgrounds, and uh, and I wanted to do that, so I did. And you did that on Geronimo. You, you I, I was lot. working on Geronimo, um, but right. I would basically hitchhike. I'd sell all my books in college and run down to Antigua, one way ticket, and and sail over to um, Belgium. You know, I attended Oxford, uh, and then uh, that got a, a bigger when I skippered a boat to New Zealand after college. I realized I couldn't be an admiral of boats, um, and so I wanted to work in a commercial fleet of vessels. So I got into tankers and bulkers through a Bahamian connection. And oh, wow. I spent three years in Singapore operating uh, tankers. And unfortunately, there were several deaths and and, and the ships suffered uh, also explosions and so forth. So um, that was pretty intense. And uh, I was glad to come back to Newport and just write. Um, but that didn't really pay the bills. So I started a delivery company and I uh, was delivering yachts back and forth. And that's where Newport Nautical Supply came in very handy because, you know, we, we would trade and <laughs> yeah, a yeah. lot of used parts you know, just to, to, to drive down costs. So I was after you visited the other day, uh, we were talking with a customer and he said he um, you brought his boat back from Bermuda uh, like, like when you're like 20 years old or something along yeah. that line. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he was he was quite impressed with you. Oh, it was fun. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was 30, uh, 31 trips I did from Bermuda and um, wow. tour from Bermuda. And at one time, I think my record was I did 11 in 15 months. So they would actually unofficially, right? They would let right. me in at night because you're not supposed to. And they're like, ah, oh, we were just, yeah, come in and don't go ashore. Just, you know, sit on the hook for the night, you know. Um, so I really enjoyed it, you know, to finding mm. this, uh, you know, find this island in, in the in the middle of the Atlantic. But the thing is, I, I was never went to sea to be a great sailor and I'm not a great sailor. I'm a good organizer. I hired a hundred people. I I put the right people on the right boat and they get the right mitch. So mm. if you fall over, you get rescued. And I was really a writer. I was really absorbing stories and the pathos. And, and, and I was just very fortunate to have survived myself, including a man overboard 16 minutes and and a sinking of one large vessel. Were you attached to the boat when you went over? I was not. No, I was no. asleep and bang, something broke and the vang and I jumped up and tried to wrestle the vang. The vang won. I was in the water. Luckily, the person at the wheel saw me and it was 16 minutes later, they managed to, to get me. But I wouldn't wish anyone in history, er, alive or dead, that horror of right. to hear and see nothing man made. Think on that for a moment. You're in mm -hmm. the ocean and you only hear the of the waves and the arr, arr, of the seagull and like the wind and the rain and the snow and night's coming right. and you're in your underwear and it is the most horrible, lonely experience. And, and I, I really recommend not falling in the water. Yeah. And one of my earlier podcasts, I spoke with Kim Hapgood of Sail Newport and she described going overboard once, or actually she, she did it to fetch a ring. It's a funny story, but what amazed her was how fast the boat, even though the boat was ghosting along, how fast it disappeared. Uh, well, it didn't disappear, but it, it got away from her. A U.S. Yeah. Marine 19 said it best. He was knocked. He not, fell off an aircraft carrier. And uh, 24 hours later in the Persian Gulf, they rescued him. They said, what's it like there, kid? And he said, I went from being the top of the food chain, a Marine on an aircraft carrier, to the bottom of the food chain in yeah. about 30 seconds. Wow. Uh, but anyway, here we are, fortunately. Um, and then I switched to studying you know, history. Mm. And I think if people wonder why would you – like find the bodies and the airplanes and the ships of, of bygone eras, you know, the Bahamas or New England graves. And the answer is simple. It, it, you know, if you grew up watching films like Gallipoli or Breaker Morant or um, any of these where the lead character is this sort of outsider mm -hmm. and, um, and he, you, you, being from a small colony or country, you have an insecurity that you're going to be the first one to go. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and so I really empathize with these. And my dad was a consul. So he would find people from, you know, Norway and Sweden and in Scandinavian countries in the Bahamas and report on them to their families back in Europe. And and that's something that I always thought was a mission that was worth doing, even though it was mm -hmm. non-renumerative. It was an honorary position. Um and sometimes it was complicated and dangerous, you know, uh, spouses would come and assault my dad for taking their spouses, you know, mm. back to Europe. Um, it's something that I found myself sliding into and, and getting a lot of value out of the intangibly, you know, mm. connecting families with their, the graves of lost ones who were just buried in a makeshift grave on a beach somewhere in the Bahamas. Wow. And I would go down there and my team and I would interview and we'd figure it out, you know. 
How long did you do that for? Are you still is that ongoing? It's ongoing. Yep. Mm. Just last month, uh, about a month and a half ago, I, I I confirmed the discovery of a B twenty six Marauder, and before I started the actual swimming to find it, um, I was in touch with the niece, and then we let a uh, nephew of one of the other pilots know. So um, I. Uh, uh, I would say in 2009, after, you know, I think upheavals like pandemics and financial crises allow some of us an opportunity to sort of discover our inner selves. Mm. So in the crash of 08, I was unemployed, had a young family, and I was working a boatyard, but I did a lot of research on my free time about U-boats on the internet with the cell phone and the Black BlackBerry, I think it was called. And um, and so I did the same uh, it, with the pandemic. You know, I just researched the heck out of these obscure topics. Um and so I found uh, an African American sailor from the potlatch in in Acklands Island in the Bahamas, a Norwegian sailor in Abaco, a Bahamian sailor in Fishers Island, New York, from 1826. Um, he was the only uh, black crew member, frankly, and he hadn't been taught to swim. And all his colleagues had been taught, and they were white, so they all survived, and he didn't. So there's really a kind of tragedy within a tragedy of mm. kind of racial discrimination, as well as. As if the elements and the waves and the shipwreck wasn't enough, you know. Right. And um and so I know the family of the owner, and he showed up and claimed the engines and and buried this gentleman, and we're going to rebury him once we find um you know more uh, relatives, you know. Wow. Um, so so it's been ongoing, but the airplane was just a few weeks ago that I found that. Yeah, I think I I don't know where I read that. Was it if it wasn't on your website, maybe it was on. <laughs> Not quite yet, but Social there's a press release. Yeah, and and that was a, a pure determination because as a teenager, I found the plane, and then um, in my in my thirties, um, I, I found another plane, and it was still very confused. And then I kind of went into a trance because there were a number of deaths in our family, mm -hmm. and and I sort of blocked out all the noise and all the wrong lat long and all the feedback and all the technology. And I said, "Well, it's actually pretty simple." Like, and I I looked at what every eyewitness described as the location. And they all had one thread in common. And so I started swimming there. The plane disintegrated. The pilots died. But I was able to find the bomber or the bomb release mechanism, the the escape hatch, the seat they sat in, mm. um, the batteries, uh, the camera they used with the film in it. Um, you name it. A dials, wow. a panel, the dials. And then the tr penultimate moment, Chris, was finding the actual B-26 Marauder four-bladed propellers on the actual engine. And I haven't been able to blow the sand away and find out what's underneath the engine, how much of the plane is there. Mm. But it was it was like having um, a pillar from the Parthenon, that kind of size almost, you know, sticking out five feet. So you could put your feet on the prop and, and your head out of the water almost. You know? Wow. It's just unbelievable. It is amazing how the sea reclaims those things so rapidly. There was a, a transitional photo series I saw on the internet somewhere, aerial photo. It looked like clear waters like the Bahamas. And it was taken over a series of years and you could just see like at first you could see the plane very fresh and then it gradually disappears until there's hardly any, you can hardly make out anything other than an outline of, of the plane. Yeah. Yeah. So I could see what you're up against. Three weeks. Now the Bahamas is translucent water and it was right in front of my family business luckily. But, there, but another thought is that this happened on Cable Beach. So millions of people uh, almost a year are swimming on that beach and just unbelievable. And I was schlepping this stuff out of the water in front of, you know, uh, gaggles of tourists, you know, mm. just amazed. What the heck is that? Um, <laughs> so over weeks I was able to determine, you know, it was about a, almost a mile square radius, but you, you just, you notice that that one little two inch high four inch wide, you know, abnormality, you know, um, is a metal, you know, mm. and then you dig and then you find a whole panel from an airplane, uh, 45 pieces. Um, now are they, do you need permission from anyone to, to, it, it, I did get a degree work. in maritime law, which yep. I haven't practiced. So, um, the, the, yeah, my caveat, you know, yeah. sport, I'm not giving legal advice right, right. now, but but uh, because there are dead persons on the site, mm -hmm. obviously confirming their whereabouts makes it sort of hallowed ground and off limits. Right. Um, however, in or it's kind of an irony because in order to sort of claim uh, until uh, if you haven't found anything, there's nothing to find because right. nothing's been found. So it's just a bit body of ocean. But once you f you need to find a piece that you can match to the aircraft to prove that you found it. 
And to do to do that, you have to potentially break the law to get it off the seafloor. So it's called underwater cultural heritage, which being over 70 years old, yes, this would. Mm-hmm. And the Bahamas are signatory to that uh, treaty. And the police uh, came, but to help me uh, several times. Uh, I, I'd been reported in distress and uh, it was raining and stormy and lightning. And I was out there alone and people assumed that I'd, <laughs> I'd bitten it, you know, because yeah. they didn't know. I didn't tell anyone what I was doing, did I? Um, but one of the extraordinary stories that I got a lot of gratification uh, from was a German colleague found that a German sub had been sunk off the Bahamas on the way to Bermuda. But, and he kind of, he identified the airplane and then left it at that. So I thought, well, how about we find that, because I'm all about humans and not just steel on steel, you know, Chris's car hits Eric's car, mm. but what about, you know, Chris, what, how did the dogs react? And how did my spouse react if she was pregnant or something? Right. You know, what's the human element? Were we carrying, you know, cartons of eggs that smash, you know, whatever it was. So I dug deeper and I used the engine numbers from the aircraft to find the crew. And luckily the worst fear is Robert Smith or, you know, Sam Jones, or you know, mm. a, a name that is... Uh, more used and luckily this guy's name was um rudolph everett um and that was really helpful because it's an unusual name mm. and i found his son and he was killed it, it, shortly after sinking the u-boat and they took pictures of the u-boat there's a rhode island woman this is a big province journal story and so i i teamed up with a wonderful journalist from the province journal but the point is that because they were shot down over europe a few weeks later um, the, the story kind of ended. And then after the war, the U.S. government, like many governments, they just wanted to wrap things up and put a bow around them. And, and yeah, you know, they would give mm. like multiple people credit for the same submarine, whereas in, in a chronolo- chronologically impossible. But they just did it. You give people, uh, you know, it's called a uh, itchy neck. Mm. Uh, you want a piece of metal around your neck to make it feel better. Right. <laughs> and so, so they gave a lot of metal. I'm not discrediting those that got medals, but right. the government was in the habit of just trying to match, not necessarily uh, matchable events. And so we proved through uh, many years of persistence to the U.S. Navy that only this uh, Everett crew had sunk the U-boat and they had photos of it, but the photos were deemed inconclusive. Mm. And the, the vessel given credit off an aircraft carrier could, had found a different boat. And we, con- we concluded that because that boat had reported on land that he'd been attacked. And so and no, so we proved it. And the, mm. and the Navy agreed. And it's the second time ever in the history of the U.S. Navy of a U-boat being changed credit. The first was in the Gulf when they discovered a U-boat with its victim next door or the killer. So that was very gratifying because mm. uh, by as luck would have it, um, Everett's son is the senator from Wisconsin. And I called his, his name, Senator Petrie, Petrie. And I called every Petrie I could. And this older lady said, very nice. You're like Rhode Island, you know? Right. Oh, you, you must mean, you know, Senator Tim Petrie. That's what you want. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm done. I'll never get to speak to a senator. They're really important and I'm a nobody. Mm. And so she said, let me give you his number. I was like, what? <laughs> really? And so she gave me his number and I called him. I said, sir, I only have a second. I'm a lawyer. You're a lawyer. And if your dad was a pilot in World War II with a different name, I need to know. Right. He said he was. And I said, well, I, I'm going to give him credit for doing something pretty amazing um, if you'd like to work with me. And so we met in New York the next week. He gave me photos of his dad and we had a Capitol building ceremony and it was very moving. Wow. Very difficult to do because you have to have immediate kin. Right. So it really won't happen again. Yeah. And it was economically undiscoverable. That's what they call it when something's too deep. <laughs> How deep was it? Ah, oh, geez. I was near the Puerto Rico Trench. So yeah. you're uh, oh, well over a mile. Yeah. I, I, I can't say specifically, but very, very, very deep. Yeah. And, and so finding the submarine um, would prove, obviously, that it was sunk where – yeah, but but it, economically undiscoverable. And they have, I think, five or six U-boats off uh, P-Town, Province Town, Cape mm-hmm. Cod, that are also sunk in, in such a way, you know, one on top of each other after the war, uh, so that uh, you can't find them. You, mm-hmm. know, you wouldn't you wouldn't go down there. Yeah, I think I when I looked at your your profile uh, on your website and you know, all the, the books you'd written, how many submarines? We're off the coast. Sure. Um, I'm just going to ballpark it. Um, but uh, Bahamas had 112 submarines and they sank 130 uh, ships. And that includes a huge area, Savannah, Bermuda, and Agata, Key West, a big, big area. that I, in, in history, um, I find, especially with the volunteers, you have to be pretty clear about what you're claiming mm-hmm. and other people may nudge you out. Um, but But if you say, I'll help you within this zone, can I get help out from your zone? That helps. So that's what I did. And and um, there are some sometimes sharp academic elbows, but uh, right. but I, I was pretty good at gathering data within my sphere 
And then when people needed it, I was good at sharing it. So my website has 16,000 pages of data, 16,000 pages. And it's not for profit, you know, nothing right. sold. So there's no paywall, nothing. Uh, anyone can get it anytime. So all the survivor statements, if you're a father or grandmother or grandfather, you know, you mm. can find it all exactly what happened. So uh, Bermuda, um, my figures may be a little skewed, but I think um, – uh, geez, about 80 subs around Bermuda, which is a smaller area. And, um, I believe about 70 ships somewhere around there and New England, uh, there were fewer sub patrols and also 35 ships sunk roughly, um, which wow. is about one for every 10 miles and one for every month of the war. Uh, but most of the subs were really using New England to transit, to, to get to the Hatteras or mm. it was all about the capes and, and it was essentially an effort to strangle the oil so it was a uh, shaped like a peace symbol yeah you know, uh, the on one prong was houston galveston in the middle was maracaibo and on the third was the ore bauxite routes out of um uh, you know, guyana you know northeast uh, south america paramaibo uh, suriname and all that most people don't appreciate that iron ore is necessary necessary to produce steel mm. and uh, bauxite is necessary to produce uh, aluminum which is necessary to produce airplanes so um and then of course panama which had a lot of fry, fruit and um and, and meat and hides and all this out of south america new zealand australia um so uh, the germans came very close mm -hmm. um, but then we figured out how to build ships a lot faster i think 23 ships were built in america in the 30s and then once world war ii happened something like five just unbelievable i don't know tens of thousands of ships right yeah it was it was liberty ships I'm interested too in the incursions. Uh, if I had one academic enemy, sort of a, you know, it would be propaganda. Mm -hmm. I think as a child, because everyone fought over my loyalties, like the British basically lied and said, oh, you know, we're like the strongest empire in the world. Like in the 70s, after the Suez crisis, 1956, we, they weren't, you right. know, it just statistically wasn't true. And um, America, any country, you know, China, North Korea, I don't care what country, but uh, don't tell me something that isn't true and, and expect me to believe it. Right. Yeah, you know, we've never been invaded. You know, we'd never lost a war. I, I was watching Vietnam as a child. Yeah, you know, we we lost it. Call it a war or not. You know, right. It didn't look like a victory. You know, um, uh, Saigon, April fifteenth, nineteen seventy five. So uh, the evacuation of the embassy after Tet. So so so, I, I I'm very skeptical when people say, "Oh, we've never been invaded." Well, the Germans shelled Nosset, Cape Cod, in World War One, mm. uh, while also you know shelling the uh, vessel. And, and there were four terrorist teams deployed into the United States in World War II, Punta Vedra, um, yeah, Megantz at New York, and uh, Frenchman's Bay, Maine, Hancock Point, and then last of all, uh, through U.S. water to get to uh, a small place called Salmon Bay, Salmon Bay in uh, New Brunswick. They all turned themselves in, mm. um, uh, but that does not negate the fact or obviate the fact that they got in, you know, and, and, and they were able to, to – the only ones that couldn't were sunk, you know, prior to landing. Right. Um, but women intercepted two of the teams. A young woman um, – I forget her name. She's about 16 um, – was uh, walking with her sister above Amagansett when they saw these semi-naked men in swim trunks because uh, they had to change. They, they had to arrive in their naval uniform and then bury it so they wouldn't get shot on, on site. And um, he waved from his swim trunks and she waved back. <laughs> and uh, and so she said, dad, dad, you know, me and my sister just saw uh, you know, a German guy like in his swim trunks waving, you know, the German uniform. And uh, and and he said, there, there, you know, daughter, you know, you, every girl thinks that, you know, it's <laughs> so right. just totally sexist and dismissive. Um, but the better one was in Hancock Point because the two men were landed and the U-boat, they would compete to dump these uh, living spies, right? Um, Alfred Langbain and, and another fellow from uh, Niantic, Connecticut, because they wanted, they, they were the last ones to see them alive. They mm -hmm. were convinced they, they were going to be shot in seconds. So they would draw straws to like dump these idiots off and you know, they'd be killed in, in seconds, you know. But they they made it through and they, they all just dumped their espionage equipment on the beach and buried it and then went, basically they were they had between a quarter million and a half million cash on average. Mm. Um, and they just parted. You know, the wine women in song. One of them was wine men in song. Um, you know, they you know, they weren't these discreet commandos. They they were out for the good life, and, wow. they, and they betrayed each other. But the and I might forgive my main accent. I can't resist. <laughs> but um, you know, this I've been on two hundred fifty islands, so I love this study of island accents. But anyway. She said she got home from a bridge tournament around 11 in a snowstorm in December 1942. And she saw, she said she came home to her husband who was the 
sheriff. And she says, you know, I've seen these two men wearing these uh, you know, $200 patent leather shoes. The berets worth at least $30, $40 each. These overcoats had to have been $200 each. And the, you should have seen the, seat, the suitcases, my dear. They had the, the brass buckles and the, the polished uh, leather. She's like, each one wearing $500 worth of equipment. No one in this village can afford to wear $500 outfits in December. You know, and right. he's like, they're there, dear. Like, I'll look into it tomorrow. And by then, like, the submarine, you know, had sunk a ship, the, the Cornwallis, which was tragic. And, and these guys had stolen a cab for a bunch of army recruits, made it to Augusta, made it onto the train. They were only apprehended by a Jewish tailor in South Station, near South Station, as they were trying to get to New York. Because the first thing you do, right, is change out of that smelly outfit you brought and get a new set of duds. Mm-hmm. Well, the tailor was German, and he recognized that, A, the manufacturer of the coat was distinctly German, vis-a-vis, you know, the markings and so forth, and his experience. And then second of all, like, it was six months old, and we'd been at war for a year or two. Mm. So he said, you're Nazi spies. And they pushed him on the ground, jumped on the train, and got away with it. Wow. They only turned themselves in. And to turn themselves in, they weren't taken seriously. They were seen as quacks. One of them, uh, the American felt homesick, so Mm -hmm. uh, he... Uh, looked up, he bumped into a friend. Uh, I think he looked him up uh, in Brooklyn and, and reminisced at Christmas time and the American way and got soft and called the FBI. And eventually they came. Uh, and but the other one in New York, he ran uh, John Dash. He was the leader. He, he wouldn't be taken seriously. So he ran to D.C. and he literally camped out for several days going up and down the hallways. I'm John Dash. I'm a German spy. I've been trained in uh, The Hague, Netherlands by, you know, von Willowitz or whatever. Mm. And uh, the, the, the head of the Abouar was an anti-Hitler. He, so he tended to get drunks, idiots, indiscreets, uh, people who were easily compromised and had blatant vices. And 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 they failed. They, they failed so badly the British b- failed to pursue the the – the trail because they thought it was a trap. Mm. So anyway, that's how we survived four invasions. Um, Japanese just sent um, lit parachutes that when touched would explode and set forest fires and stuff Mm. and killed a few people. Newport, of course, has a cemetery nearby um, with British sailors from a sunken, I think, trawler and um, German sailors. Um, They have one unknown Einbekanter from, I'm going to say a U-853, but... You know, when you study, you know, 250 U-boats right. <laughs> by the hour and and at least three or 400 vessels. Which cemetery is that? Because my wife, my wife is British originally. Okay. She, I think it's on Remembrance Day. She and some other British folks go over and I don't know if they put flags, they put something. That's her. That's the one. On it's the on graves. Farewell Street yep. opposite the residential area. That's correct. So, so it is that small annex that the policemen like to drink their coffee in and and, <laughs> and, and, and and contemplate the universe, you know. Right. And uh, so they back in there. Um, uh, but the public is, it's public cemetery. Yeah. And it's against the far fence. What's interesting to me, Chris, is there are two missing headstones. And I've, I'm not a grave fanatic, but I've been to uh, I've been to enough gravestones that my mother scolded me against bringing first dates to hunt for gravestones. So, <laughs> so that that's you know, I have your partner, you know, shine the lights on the car by maneuvering around a parking lot at night. Right, uh, not a great first date, but um, <laughs> but anyway, so they. Uh, I found a mass grave of Italians in, in central uh, Iceland, in New York, Farmingdale. Um, and then here in Newport, you've got this anomaly of the, the unknown sailor, which was a skull that was taken as a trophy. And the, the German church, the German embassy and the U.S. Navy gave that skull an honorable, that person, an honorable burial without knowing who they were. Mm. And then the other was a, a Harvard um, graduate who was running a sub chaser off Newport and described it as a malodorous cadaver and at least brought the cadaver back to shore. A number of them just stripped the clothing and, and papers and just yeah, left the cadaver. Um, so anyway, that's who was buried, U550 under Hannard. And that was sunk after sinking the Pan Pennsylvania, one of the largest, newest tankers we had. And, and, and uh, the sub hid under the tanker. Mm. So we shot the tanker thinking that's where the you know the action was and um, it caught fire and we um very bravely one of the commanders of a destroyer went alongside the u-boat grabbed i think 10 or so of the survivors leaving about 45 in the water 44 and then took off and and i love his command he said if they start firing on me you fire on us that's what he told his colleagues wow so, so if they if we go down like don't spare us. Just kill us all. You know, oh, uh, he's pretty brave. And, yeah. then, and then he he disembarked. Uh, people, um, I'd like to give an antidote. Mm-hmm. We're given this sort of hoopla version of history. 
you've all heard of the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. One of the worst death resulting from sinking in World War II was in the Battle of the Bulge when it happened at Christmas. That was famous, you know. And so we scrambled anyone with a warm pulse, you know, from England to go to France to Cherbourg, like Christmas, I think it was New Year's Eve. And and so a lot of people on shore were partying. And this ship, which was Belgian, and I, 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 I'm not going to venture the name, but it was Belgian Prince or something. I, I, I'm not, anyway. The ship was a passenger vessel. It was sunk by a torpedo. And as it sank, a lot of corn-fed Midwestern American soldiers who had just been grabbed off of a troop ship and taken to Cherbourg, where everyone was oblivious to their fate, very, you know, a British destroyer came up alongside the ship. There's thousands of men on this ship. It came up alongside and just did the same brave thing, just banged up against it and said, get your bottoms onto the ship. Anyone who just... Get on the ship. It was obvious. You didn't have to say anything. And, you know, as they disengaged, they pulled away. You know what they heard? Mommy. Mommy. It was a lot of 18-year-olds. You know, oh, they didn't know where the hell they were. They're right. in the ocean. It is freezing. It's New Year's. They're drowning. They're going to die. They're, they're completely disorientated. There's no leadership. There's no – they've been abandoned. <laughs> they're, they're done. And they, in the absence – they they call for their moms, you know, right? And um and when the Steuben and another ship sank under a Russian submarine torpedo on the, one of the greatest um, evacuations in history from Prussia into West Germany, Kiel, you know, uh, at, towards the end of nineteen forty five to get East Front troops out of the Russian you know death machine, um, the, 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 those that the, there was about six thousand people that died. The Wilhelm Gustav and the Steuben, there were about six thousand people who died. This is the worst sinking death in the history of mankind and the sound that the few that survived heard was pop up pop 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 pop, pop. Mm -hmm. they were east front soldiers who were injured they knew they weren't going to survive they had their firearms and they took care of their own fate and so those are the details of history that i think are very moving right um there are stories i've read of a canadian holding his son's dead body for two days you know because he just wasn't going to let it go you know he had to go back to his if he was lucky go back to his wife and and they made him put it over the sun but it, it, uh, artifacts are so important to telling a story like a wrecked plane a piece of a wrecked plane mm. you know that um, a grave site that's why it's so compelling because that body has come you know was born in germany and and and, and fought in an, a submarine or an italian or a, African American from Bahamas, whatever it is, and and it is such tangible proof. This is not an idea. I'd love to find a shell in Nosset, as the Germans dropped a lot of shells. Mm. You know, um, th those little details. You know, yeah, something physical. Yes, that you can put your hand on. It is amazing. I always heard that. The, yeah, there's a oh, there's a German U boat off Block Island, sunk off Block Island, but that was the only one I'd ever heard of. I didn't. I had no idea the scope of it. Mm. You know. Another one off um, uh, off Nantucket, U uh, five five, and then one sunk by trawler, um, pretty much between P Town and uh, and and the Nova Scotia, and then um, uh, and then last of all, we intentionally sank uh, five or six, I think six or seven uh, submarines right off P Town, sort of forty miles north, uh, and that was. Um, that was that was that. Um, two details that just uh, again the personal aspect. Mm. Roald Dahl, who's written all these, you know, the Charlie you know, the Chocolate Factory and the Giant Peach, and you know, he's a very charismatic man. He actually grew up with a ship chandlery in Western England. His father was a, a, a Norwegian, um, so you can relate to that. Right. Um, but two very personal anecdotes. One, when he finally made it from Kenya after crashing in Egypt to eat to 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 Athens to defend Greece against the onslaught of the Nazi war machine, you know, um, because the 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 Italians had failed. Um, the point is that he was hurt because he finally had taken many months to get there, and nobody wanted to talk to him, and nobody befriended him, and he was young and he'd never been in combat. And then after two or three days, he realized why. Every day there were ten or twelve planes, mm -hmm. and every day four or five would come back, or six, or f three, or eight. And he realized that they were dying so fast that nobody wanted to risk liking him. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was very meaningful. Another story, and this is also to do with Greece, and it, it sounds he from Mornings and Heights in Melbourne, Australia. And Melbourne has, after the war, because of the shipping migration, the largest concentration of Greek citizens anywhere outside of Athens. So why does it matter? A friend of mine was British. His father had fought in Greece for the British, trying to protect them, part of the retreat to Corfu and Crete. And he said, 
when his father, this is in like the 80s, when the father would walk into a Greek taverna, the father British had emigrated to, mm. to, to Melbourne. When he walked into a Greek taverna, they stood. Really? They stood. They yeah. knew he had fought for their country. Wow. I, I always get choked up at that story. It, it, it's so sweet. It's such a small gesture. Mm. And that's what I try to do. A gesture to honor men and women who went missing, who a, a lot of the world doesn't care about or know about. And it, particularly with the Germans, you, you won't get Germans engaged about the war. They don't get excited the way that Americans might or British or, you know, or is interested. And it's not open about it. It's 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 something shameful for a lot of people. Right. And, and they, they, you know, they view it very fundamentally differently. Um and so um, getting – I have not been able to to engage um, German families in the stories I've uncovered. But but I get um, folks from all over, South Africa, um, New Zealand, Australia. And then there's something in my line of work which I very uh, happily call the missing invoice. I don't know if you, <laughs> have you heard of this? Yeah. Yeah, where you do something honorable mm. in for like the Norwegian archives and they really like what you're doing and you tell them, why haven't you billed me? I've been – for three months you've been supporting me on this project. Mm. Oh, uh, we'll look into that, Captain Weaver. You know, and it's a missing invoice. It's a big privilege mm. when your invoice goes missing because it means that they've determined that you're doing something that they want to support. Right. They won't come right out and say, we're giving you money, we're funding you, but they, they'll – missing invoice. And how do do you seek funding for these research projects, or do you do it all on your own? I don't. A few times I've thought about it, mm. um, and and then I I sort of plotted through, and I sort of sp <laughs> spent my nest egg on a lot of this stuff. But it's very gratifying. But then I do charge an, a straight fee to write other people's books mm. as a ghostwriter, or as a, or as a research. What did my dad do during World War II, or or what did this historic figure doing? Do? Yeah, and those or tell my story. So last year I published ten books, or or finished 10 books mm. um and then some and so institutions everything from a company to so that sort of keeps the lights on to some extent mm -hmm. and then i'm a captain and i i'll do whatever i can you know right um but um but to answer your question no when it comes to i've never accepted any and that is something that i'm very proud of because and i wouldn't want to change mm. I, I don't accept uh uh, donations or so you know from governments or academia or an employer or anything like that there's all self uh, funded i i took part on a tv program where they uh, paid the bills to like find this guy mm. but no one interfered with my uh, hunt you know they didn't uh, what was I, that show that was a norwegian that he was a fascinating man i really like him his name is tora stromoy and every year for eight years, I lobbied him to get him to come to the Bahamas and find a dead Norwegian. Mm. Well, two things happened, Chris, that are extraordinary. First of all, he said, oh, it will never happen. Like, I'll never get in the budget, you know. And so so I said, well, well, here's your budget, buddy. And I gave him a budget from the moment he left his desk in Trondheim uh, to Oslo, uh, to Fort Lauderdale on Norwegian, to Abaco, you get the picture, to the hotel, to the meals, to how many people. I mean, you name it. The, you know, the, the tips, I mean, everything. I had it down to like within $20. And for my yacht delivery, that's what I did. I calculated. So he said, that's impressive. Like 4,000 or whatever the amount was, you know, mm. uh, I'm on. I'll see you in the Bahamas. And then another thing happened. A, a, a cruise ship landed in the Bahamas and they took over as they do these little islands. And they had a, when you let people onto an island, you have to take a lot of measures. So you have a botanist, you have a nurse, you have all that stuff. So the botanist fell in love with the nurse. <laughs> so the botanist was an, a Bahamian a gentleman who ran the national park and Marcus. And then his wife was Siren and she was Norwegian because it's Norwegian Caribbean lines, right? Right. It actually makes sense. She's a merchant sailor like me. And he said, when he met her and they're both in their forties, he said, Hey, you know, I, I really like you and I'm going to marry you. And she's like, like, heck you will, you know, like, who are you? Yeah. I haven't even met you, you know? And he bought her a wild flowers from the, and they married, you know, lo and right. behold. And she settled and they raised pigs and, and she's the nurse. And it's a really cool story. So I donated a sign that I made in Chinatown that said, this is the Olaus Martin Gams Johansson, you know, Edward, you know, beach. And he landed here in March 12th, 1942, whatever. And mm. he died and he's buried at the such as Alexandria Church right here. And 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 I put this big sign. I have no authority, Chris. 
to do so. <laughs> I had no permission to do so. I made it in Chinatown because I worked for McAllister downtown and I took it to the Bahamas and I put it on a mailboat and they charged me $7 and I said, give it to Marcus. And they said, we'll deliver it to Marcus. And they gave it to Marcus and Marcus sent me a picture of it nailed to the tree. Marcus's wife is Norwegian. The man who died was Norwegian. It may have no authority to hang that sign, yeah. but you're going to have to go through a couple people to take it down. <laughs> you know, I yeah. was pretty comfortable that no one was going to, you know, yeah. take it down. Oh, that's so. a clever way to. And it's still hanging. Brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a there's time to be formal and petition and ask for help. And there's a time to make a sign for a hundred bucks or so and set, send it for $7 and, and, and just get it done. We talked about the human element. The boat, uh, The book you wrote, Swan Sinks. That's this, one of the shortest books I've ever written, and it's really straightforward. Mm -hmm. Italian sub comes to America because they had a huge fleet of subs, and the Germans really wanted them. And they were called, for lack of a better word, they were in Bordeaux, which is southwest Bay of Biscay. And anyway, Carl Dionitz, the gross admiral, wanted these subs, but this Italians fought the war differently than the Germans. They had these beautiful machines, because they weren't prohibited by the Versailles Treaty, I, I guess, you know, from building them. But but their attitude towards a, a wolf pack was different. A German job was to see a ship or a convoy, and then call all the buddies together until his colleagues arrive, and then do a mass attack and destroy the convoy, ideally, right? Mm. But the Italians would be like, a ship, hey! And they'd attack. And the Germans like, no, 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 you know, wait. Like, don't get the glory. Oh, a ship, hey! Attack. So they didn't work. And the, the subs were bigger and more, you know, less agile. Mm. So the, the Germans finally said, look, okay, fine. Sommergibli, the Italians, you go... You go to the Bahamas and you do a rear guard action. You got about six subs. Among them was the Da Vinci. I can't name them all, but um, the Fecio de Casato was the head of the one I liked the most. Um, and 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 he 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 was on the submarine and he was very aggressive. And every three days he was saying a ship, Norwegian, a, a British, blah, 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 blah. And he came to San Salvador and I read his diaries in Italian. And he said, hey, this is San Salvador. This is where Columbus landed. He was from Genova. He's an Italian. This is wonderful. And um, – and he sank this ship, which is the Signet. Now, the Signet had a long history, but it was owned by Greeks who are still in the Bahamas. And they're, they're British Greeks, a very established, very old school, a very genteel family, you know. Um, uh, and so in the researching this book, I was able to go to this lovely family, uh, to their uh, – uh, I spoke in Bahamas. I, I don't want to say too much. But in mm. New York, I was welcomed in London uh, in this uh, gorgeous – and they took out – they had a, a, a ladder – and they had a gentleman in a white gloves, you know, who took out the original charter party from this signet. The, wow. The, that's why it's called the Swan Sinks, because signet, the Kiknos in Greek, mm. in Andros, in, in uh, Chora, which is the owner's village. And then you have Sines, which is the captain's village. And a captain hosted me. I stayed in the captain. The swans go out into the ocean, Chris. Mm. So- they are real mariners. The the, you know, the the swans are mariners, for God's sake. Right. And when the buildings were bombed in World War II, they cleared a plaza to honor the sailors. So it's very discreet. It's very modest. And they don't like tourists. As someone who grew up in tourist towns, I was so happy because they completely ignored us. You know, <laughs> and, and even though I was with you know ship owners, and they knew sure. darn well who everyone was. You know. Anyway, I loved the experience because I got to Piraeus and Atheni and all these places. So it's a 100-page book. And it, it came down to a diner in Wakefield, Massachusetts, because all 30 men were given an immediate exemption from the U.S. visa, and a lot of them settled in the United States. And one of them created the diner in Wakefield. And 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 they and they they lived in Charlestown and Somerville and and, and settled in, in Palm Beach and became doctors. And and I contacted every family because now with Fold3 and Ancestry3.com, you can find anyone almost. You can right. find every manifest of every ship. Scars, height, weight, tattoos, how much money they had, who they were staying with, where they came from, where they were born, who their mother was, where the mother was from, the father from. It's unbelievable the level of granular detail. Wow. And with a bit of sleuthing, you can quite quickly you know, find people. But I did make one mistake, one of my key witnesses. The older gentleman didn't answer soon enough for my impatience. So I Facebooked some of the younger generation. Oh, mm. <laughs> from that point, I was cut off completely from that family. Oh, really? Eventually, I found an in-law who spoke off the record, but uh, yeah. you got to be careful. 
It's funny you should ask though. And, and if I did just to explain the Swan Sings, mm. um, during COVID, my girlfriend's also a writer. And so we spent, you know, 25 months and I produced 25 books. Now, some of them are drafts for publishers later, but I took all the data and put them into a cover mm. so that I don't have to have shelf after shelf. When I finish a book, Chris, I donate it to an archive. So in the Bahamas, they have like eight linear feet of my archive. So your know, maritime academies, whatever they are, the books, because mm. I, I can't be weighted down for them. But the trick is to stay sane. If I would recommend don't publish 25 books in 25 months, but if you insist on trying something nuts like that, no offense to nuts, <laughs> uh, but uh, do a long book, like a 950 page history of the Bahamas, you know, in World War II encyclopedia mm. or the trilogy, whatever it is. And then after each long book, you do a short fun one. So, yo, know, sea stories. Oh, there's a 70, you know, and then 50, first 50 years of my life in 50 pages, 50 mm -hmm. pages, done. Swan sinks, 100 pages. It's a chapter that's embellished and focused on just some guys. And so um, that makes it a little more palatable, you right. know, little booklets. And um, my record was writing one book in one day. Another was publishing from the concept to publishing and having a man seven weeks. That was my... Um, mm. And then for clients, you know, it, it really de depends on what their needs are. Um, but but I think it's important. I didn't expect to live beyond 40. So I published all my books before 40. Mm. And then when I thought, okay, well, now I've quit a lot of stuff so that I live longer, hopefully touch wood. But the point is, <laughs> is that I have a story to tell. Like I've learned something. Mm. And my father always said, you can't just read. You have to explain what you read. You have to share it. Mm. And I'm a little late, long and tooth to be a teacher or to start that whole profession. But but there's vlogging, there's podcasting, there's all these fun ways to get a, a concept across right. in a sort of entertaining way. The other day I was filming a gas ship, very serious, coming in from Europe. And then I'm like, oh, look down on the seabed there. There's a five purchase tackle from an old ship that lying in the mud, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's trying to make it uh, humorous. Yeah, I like those. I started following you on Instagram and I like the narrative narrative that goes along with the ship coming in because a lot of people just take a, a static picture a still and then a, a description if you're lucky and and maybe you know not get it right i don't know but most of and most of them are are yachty type things they're not there's not a lot of commercial uh images it's funny because uh my college roommate lives in boston and uh from his window i can i can look out and see different things yeah a lot of good ships there too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got Braintree and um, yeah. But most people don't think of our cities as as important international ports. No, but Newport's got offshore wind. It's got a sunken U boat out there, right? And uh, it, it former well, a navy base, a coast guard base, a tugboat base. I saw a tanker today. A salt importing. Um, it used to be coal. Um, I'm sure wind will pick that up. Uh, obviously, a yachting capital. Well, the latest thing is this endeavor. I don't know if you've read about that. The Captain Cook ship. Oh, yes. They believe they found, and there's white buoys. They've been out there for a couple of years. There's white buoys marking it. And I guess the Australians pretty much raised their hand and said, yes, this is it. We found it. Um, and then I think the- somebody, Dr. Abbas. Yeah, yeah. Said, hang on, not so fast. Yeah. And a, I guess if it was sunk for the purposes of- Blockade. Yeah. They would have stripped any anything valuable off of it so that- you know, a bell or something recognizable isn't isn't there. But yeah, that that's been in the news lately. And they made an announcement and there was a short video that people shared on the local media down here. But it I guess it's really hard because you're dealing with timbers in mud. Yeah. You know, we're not dealing with a nice chunk of an aircraft or, uh, you know, yeah. a propeller blade that has a, a, a number etched in it. Yes. So. I tend to believe the folks who are, who are taking their time to sort of measure. I had the privilege at, a, at, a, at an event once because I, I got a master's in marine affairs where I had to meet Dr. Robert Ballard. Mm. Bob Ballard. And, and, you know, my son was there and my son went forward of me and immediately Dr. Ballard took a knee. And we went right down to eye level with my son and oh, was nice. into listening to him and talking with him. And I thought, that's a good teacher. That's a good person that does that, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, that he, he was more interested, you know, in passing it on. Yeah. I went to a talk he gave because uh, a friend of mine had picked up on, this was a long time ago, like 20 something years ago, 25 years ago. And it was a, it was a gripping talk. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was all about how he was hired. It was top secret Navy stuff. They were hired to find a Navy boat oh. that had gone down. And then he said, if I find it, can I then go look for the Titanic? And they're like, yeah, whatever, pal. And and he did. And he proved everybody <laughs> wrong. 
Um, it, 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 I will admit, it, there's not a cookie cutter. You, you can't give up, and it does make you a little bit nutty. You know, like mm. you, the more you study the folks you're looking for. I mean, I spent uh, many trips alone, walking, camping, hiking, uh, and a couple times calling out to like this Norwegian I was looking for. You know, and then it took the team from Norway who were much more focused than me and much more pragmatic. You know, and, mm. and you know, I was thinking of emptying a high school class to help volunteer. It's an accident waiting to happen. So, uh, so you know, it does help. Um, and then, of course, I admire the divers here who, yeah. who have such a harder um, environment to work in. And the Bahamas are fairly current free and very um, uh, opaque waters, you know. But the Gaspé and a lot of the boats up here, you know, uh, you have to you have to dive into cold, uh, frigid, uh, turbulent water. Yeah, you see, you see them diving in the summer. And and again, you can see all the white buoys. The, the buoys are still out there. And I imagine they'll resume when the water warms up again. Yeah. But, but I, I will say, too, that um, all, just having um, an, an outside-the-box perspective as well and a self-confidence. Mm. So, for example, the, the, the Bahamian gentleman who, who, who wrecked on the, on the vessel was the, the Thelma Phoebe. Well, I was a guest speaker in Fisher's Island, very uh, uh, kind invitation. And, and so um, he was there for three days. So each day I combed the coast in a way that others either – hadn't or that i was lucky but i found brass fittings you know that mm. almost certainly were from this boat and and you know the, the coast had crumbled a bit and the stones had come down and you know if you poked around enough didn't have a metal detector or anything mm. you know just looked long and hard and i, I i'm sure i pulled a bunch of junk up too uh, <laughs> but i got a freight a freighter of a freezer door you know um so um a bit of determination you know it pays off. It goes a long way. But it, it, it is extremely emotional when you do connect. Mm. Uh, when I found the engines for that airplane, uh, I, I was so taken aback for half an hour that a boat came to ask if I needed help. You know, because it was just me with a mask and, and no, no GPS, no mm. camera, no, you know, just me and a little surfboard, you know, just looking. Looking. <laughs> so so it, it helps to be um, a little eccentric, I guess you could say. Yeah. And what, what do you... What direction are you headed now? What, what's your next project? Good question. Um, I've donated that parts of the airplane mm -hmm. um, to to the Bahamas uh, National Museum, and um, uh, I'm working on a sort of a few books. Uh, I'll probably have to, you know, get, get a day job again, right? Um, uh, but it's been a good couple of years. COVID uh, enabled me, you know, to to do uh, what I dreamed of, and and living in cool places like Cuddy Hunk, you know, you can live economically in, in the winter in some really neat places. Um, right. But uh, uh, my goal, Chris, would be since I've identified, say, just aircraft and mm -hmm. just Bahamas, there are living witnesses to. What happened? And there were living witnesses to a ship that had 48 American folks uh, come ashore and they were rescued by a lesbian heiress, Joe Carstairs. So uh, film, books don't really uh, keep someone like me alive, hmm. uh, even though it's my traditional medium. So um, I would like to go into film and, and, and television. And a bit like my esteemed colleague in Norway, Tora Pasporo, who was an Olympic walker, who's a very determined guy, very engaging. In Norway, he was considered the second or third most trustworthy behind Jesus Christ in Norway because wow. he had this show for Ancestry. Mm. And his first show was a, was a failure because he found a Russian who had thought the war was still going on into the 70s in Norway. Mm. And they found him and he was schizophrenic, right? Because naturally, he, anyway. And somehow between custody, when he was arrested in the North Cap Circle, Polar Circle, and, and being deported from Oslo, he uh, impregnated one of the female guards. Oh. And so she had a baby. So she the show was designed bringing the baby back to Yuri. So the, it, was, it was the opening show, and they flew the baby and they to Yuri 20 years later. And Yuri had died like the day before. Oh my. And there was, it's, I don't mean to laugh, it's sad, but you know, he, right. he lived a full life, you know. But, uh, but you know, his huge banner, you know, yeah, Yuri, you know, welcome <laughs> home, Yuri, kind of thing. And they had to roll it up. And he, he, he succeeded notwithstanding that failure. Yeah. And I would like to be a sleuth who finds missing sailors and pilots. Mm. Um, there was, a, as you've heard, a, a, a Bermuda Triangle episode after the war, mind you, mm. of several planes, a, a squadron that went missing off the Bahamas and, and crashed and, and they all died. And, and nobody knows exactly why. Well, everyone can tell you that's interested in that topic, what they had for breakfast, who they broke up with, where they were born, the whole backstory. Well, I have hundreds and hundreds of aviators that died in 75 sh aircraft crashes in the Bahamas, you know, 
and nobody knows anything about them. Right. You know, and, and I'd like to bring recognition to those men. And those are the people that I fight to serve is mm. the, that, that nobody's ever heard of. And it's the unmarked grave. It's the, it's the, it's the crash site that everyone wondered what it was, but didn't know. Cause the Bahamas is, you can't swing a cat without hitting a drug plane. Um, oh, right. So when you, when you do find a legitimate modern recent wreck, you know, not that one death is more legitimate than the other, but a historical wreck of that magnitude, um, then uh, it, people don't take you seriously at first because mm. they, there's an assumption that it's a drug plane. Wow. Ironically, the B-26 Marauder, which was instrumental in bombing Monte Cassino in Italy and bombing German factories, a medium range bomber from England to Germany, Netherlands and France. Guess what happened as soon as the war ended? 2,000 plus of them were scrapped to build factories in Germany. Oh, <laughs> so they were their, yeah. their job was to destroy factories in Germany. And, and as soon as the war was over, they became factories in Germany. They so, used the material. Yeah, kind of ironic. That's huh? amazing. Yeah. I had a thought. Well, you repurpose cool stuff too here at. Uh, yeah, we do. Newport well, it's Auto better than well. landing in a landfill. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. So if people want to learn more about your work. The best way is your website. Is that That's the, right. the best portal? EricWeberg.com. I'm very active on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook. Um, uh, but the EricWeberg.com it has a list of the 40 plus books. And, hmm. um, you know, the uh, Amazon. And, uh, the, uh, nothing pleases me more than hearing from folks that say that what I studied reconnected them with someone, that, a loved one, hmm. you know. And, um, and, and that's, that's, that's the real meaning, you know. For me, I, when I write a book or an episode or a chapter, it has to be unique. It has to have not been told. All respect to the Titanic, someone who writes a book about the Titanic may be less interested in adding new perspective as in the fact that millions of people collect everything written about the Titanic. Right. I write more uh, bespoke or, 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 or offbeat uh, books about – U-Boats New England had not been written, particularly about from the German perspective. And uh, same with Bermuda, same with Bahamas. So um, – I try to uh, try a different angle mm -hmm. and um, and and tell a story that's much more than just steel um, that really encompasses what was special about that ship, what was special about those men. Mm. Um, and even in the, the cases, which were sadly quite often, where everyone was killed from a ship, um, you know, often you can find a U-boat that finds the lifeboat later, or you, you can find a connection or a, a man or woman that got off the ship and went on to a, a different career. Mm. Yeah. So... Um, and ports like Newport um, are, are are the bedrock, you know, and libraries within ports like Newport, and uh, and it isn't all online. I, mm. I understand some naval colleges have a course on find an artifact, which mm. I think is so neat. And Clive Cussler did a lot of that too, mm. you know, mixing sort of fun and excitement with real life, you know, uh, real drama. People. Yeah. yeah, I just remembered what it was. When we're talking, you're talking about that program in, is it Norway? Or, yes, yeah. yes. It's called uh, NRK2, Trana, Tore Pospore. It's Tora on the Trail, T O R E on the Trail. It made me think, and, and with regard to what you're trying to do maybe here in America, there's a British TV show. Of course, I streamed a lot of TV from the UK because of my wife called Coast. And it's a, it's, there's several hosts usually in it, and there's several segments. It blends history, archaeology, and and geography all together and and it, it brings it all together in a nice package and and they do different they, they go around the whole of the uk essentially mm -hmm. and so there'll be a different segment and then there'll be the okay this is what the scenery looks like this is the history and then they bring in the dr so-and-so and she's the archaeologist so they they dig up and they use a bit of graphics to show you what someone might have might have seen in the you know, 17th century or something like that, or even, even they go way back, you know, to mm. long way back. So yeah, that, that's an interesting program. And you, to answer your question as succinctly as possible, the biggest distinction, I would like to be a finder of wrecks or, you know, mm. tangible proof. Now ships, when they get in distress, they're like dogs that go into the forest to die alone. The ships want to stay the heck away from reefs you know, right. for the most part and, 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 and islands like the Bahamas, but the airplanes make for land. They want to crash on land. They want it to, or near land, you know? So, so that's one of my goals out of the 75 uh, men that crashed in the Bahamas area. And they were all memorialized in the, cathedral where i grew up in hmm. church and so finding just five of them or three of them or two of them, i found one just and another has been found so you know just finding a handful would be very very meaningful hmm. 
And, but finding the actual human remains, remains is almost impossible. Right. I mean, in the deep water, of course, they, they might be clustered in the cockpit or something. But but in 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 in, in the case of this plane, it, it landed uh, the day before a hurricane hit and, oh. and just impacted on the water. You know. All right. So. Anything else you want to mention? I think we've covered, yeah, I, I covered would, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I would only say to students, like to mm. young young students, uh, boys and girls all over the world, whatever language or background, don't accept what your teachers and even your parents say it w- w- was the story because mm. it's never complete. It's never complete. And, and and you can always add more to it. And and even World War II, the most written about topic in the history of humankind, more ink has been spelled on it. That you 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 can always add another layer, another context, um, and another perspective. Mm. You know? And um, and uh, a, a, a very quick anecdote: when the people of Crete were invaded by paratroopers to to off to, to eject the British, the German paratroopers, they they met them with pitchforks and they they killed the paratroopers. They they didn't they were simple country folk, many of them, and then they uh, killed them with farm tools. Mm. The German elite uh, paratroopers, and and um, it had a big impact on the, the German strategy. But there were reprisals that if you kill thousands of people that fall out of the sky that they might the survivors might be upset and they were and they did massacres and Mm. and there was some footage taken of a german photographing the massacre as it was evolving and and the men were rounded up and they were taken away and it was very horrific very disturbing now the gentleman the the person who took those photos was thrown out of the army and almost killed himself because he 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 vocalized against the massacre and Mm. he risked his own career my point is this and it's it, it, it take it as you will. But like I say, there's always two sides of the story. After the war, that German in the 50s or 60s who had witnessed and photographed it, he came, he asked permission to address the villagers of that particular village. And they uh, they acceded to that request and they had in the cafe, the taverna, they, a table and the older men of the village, the leaders – met with him and he spoke his piece and showed his photos and explained how he'd been persecuted for trying to protect them and stand up for them. And then he asked some questions and they answered. And what I find so interesting is not only that these two completely disparate, that one of the men who was responsible for er eradicating the whole manhood of a village, and then the men who had tried to build a village back in the decades since, they stopped talking and he said, but I want more. And they said, they, they discussed among themselves and they said to him, we have carefully studied all of the edicts and principles of our culture, of our language, of our ethnic group, and of our locale in Crete. Mm. And we have surmised that we have met all of our hospitality obligations to you. They have been met. We, 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 you are now excused. So I, I thought it was very powerful. You wow. know, they, they were yeah. willing to listen to this enemy and only to a point, and then they and they were willing to not kill him. Right. You know, most cultures, they would, you know, he would have been tarred and feathered, you know. He well, wouldn't have gotten out of that village alive, you know. Um, and so it, I think it's very interesting. There, there's always that detail, and it's never 100% cut and dry. There's mm. always some nuance, uh, uh, what effect it has in the real world. But this has been a real pleasure, Chris. Yeah, I, I no, I appreciate you really taking the time. To My first it. podcast. I'm very grateful. All right. No worries. Thank you for listening to Standing Before the Mass podcast with Chris Heaton, sponsored by Newport Nautical Supply. Please like and subscribe wherever you get to your podcasts. Additional sponsorship comes from the Neptune Day Anchor, the first single-use anchor system 